president of of the Metro Detroit Book and Author Society. And I want to welcome you to this very special event in our summer reading program, summer series. So for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, I just wanna give a quick introduction to the Book and Author Society. It's a nonprofit organization that promotes reading, books, authors, and literacy. And we do this via our virtual programs and the grants that we give to libraries and other literacy organizations. And we hope that you will um, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and stay in touch with us because we have a lot of great events throughout the year, and we would love to have you back. You can also sub subscribe to our newsletter at bookandauthor.org. So today, I'm so excited. We have a great program for you in honor of all the summer reading programs at libraries everywhere. And we have our one of our favorite children's book authors with us, Kelly DiPuccio. So welcome, Kelly. Thank you, Kathy. It's great to be here this afternoon. You are our first children's book author that we've had on our program. So, so exciting. Well, that's good. Um, and then you have nobody to compare me to. So <laughs> you're gonna, the bar is set high for you. I mean, you're going to set the bar very high. <laughs> and um, speaking of high bars, we also have a very special guest interviewer today, Jen Taggart, who is the assistant department head of youth services and an absolute rock star in the world of children's um, services. And she is assistant department head at the Bloomfield Township Public Library. So welcome, Jen. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Kathy. So we're really glad to have both of you here today, and we can't wait to hear your conversation. But I just want to go through a couple of um, housekeeping details, and I also want to give a special shout out to our partner bookstore, The Book Beat in Oak Park, Michigan. They have many of Kelly's books in stock, and you can buy them in the store or purchase them online. And we'll talk more about that um, towards the end of the program, but I do want to let you know that, um, you know, after listening to Kelly and Jen, you're going to want to go out and read and probably have in your own home library Kelly's books. So just know that they're available for you at the book beat. So for everyone in the audience, I want to let you know that you are absolutely welcome to ask questions. We want you to ask questions. Um, we're looking forward to your questions because I know a lot of kids are signed up and this is your chance to talk to the person who writes your favorite books and that's really cool. So get those questions ready. And if there's something that you wanna know, you can type it into the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. And if you need a little help with that, um, just ask whoever's around and maybe they can do it for you. So the way that this works is Jen and Kelly are going to chat for a little while and then we will dive into the questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Jen and Kelly and can't wait to hear what you talk about. So have fun. Thanks, Thanks Kathy. Thanks. All right. So um, I'm excited to be here with you today, Kelly. Um, I want to give a little bit of an intro to everybody um, about you. So Kelly is an award-winning author of over 30 children's books. Two of her books, uh, Grace for President and The Sandwich Swap, one of my absolute favorites, um, it, they were New York Times bestsellers. And um, let me see what I learned about Kelly. Um, she had a pet goat when she was younger, as one does. <laughs> and um, she, oh, and like most teens growing up in the 1980s, including me, uh, she had feathered hair and large glasses. And, you know, <laughs> as one does. And so, and Kelly and her husband and three children live in Michigan. Yay! <laughs> So um, today she's going to talk about a couple of her recent titles, uh, including Una and Not Yeti, and she's also going to share a reading from Una. Uh, so, um, so let's get started here. So um, Kelly, you have written so many children's books. Uh, why did you become a writer? Uh, well, you know, I've always been a big reader. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, I loved books and it never occurred to me growing up that I could grow up to be an author. That just seemed like this big fancy career that only happened to people who lived in like New York or Los Angeles. And, you know, I was just a regular kid growing up on a small farm in Rochester, Michigan. 
And I really didn't dare to dream that big. Um, so it wasn't until many, many years later, um, after I had my own children, I had gone to college, I went to Michigan State, I had a degree in child psychology, I worked in the foster care system. So I had like many different careers and incarnations before I became a children's author. But like I said, it wasn't until I had my own three kids and I was you know, reading a lot of books to them that I rediscovered picture books and I just fell in love with them. You know, it'd been a long time since I'd read them. And so I was kind of rediscovering the genre through my own children. And that's kind of when I first got the idea, like, I wonder if I could do this. So yeah, that was a long time ago. My kids are adults now. I'm actually a grandma now. Yes. <laughs> so that, that's one thing um, I need to do is update my bios because it's the one thing I hate to write is my own bio. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it's painfully out of date, but I do still have the big glasses and pretty much the feathered hair that hasn't really changed. Um, but yeah, the first book I ever published was way back in 2004 and it was a book called Bed Hogs. And um, it was inspired by my young children at the time. They were rotten, horrible, lousy, no good sleepers. And they were always waking up at night. And um, so they inspired my very first children's book, Bed Hogs, illustrated by Howard Fine. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, so speaking of inspiration, so you have written about so many different types of characters from pigs to um, cupcakes to zombies um, to um, yetis, I mean, so many different types of characters. Um, so you mentioned your children were inspirations. Mm -hmm. um, did anything else inspire any of these other characters that you've written about? Oh, for sure. You know, and I always tell kids when I go into schools and talk to them about, you know, you can find story ideas really anywhere. And I really and truly do. I mean, uh, I wrote a book years ago called What's the Magic Word? And it's about a little bird who hatches from an egg during a windstorm. And that pretty much happened from this window here, you know, looking out my window. And um, so, yeah, a lot of the stories are inspired by people I meet or um something that a uh, story that I might come across in the news or just something that I see. So yeah, a lot of the inspiration just comes from things that I see or hear really. Um, uh, I wrote that book, Everyone Loves Bacon, <laughs> which is a really silly story, but that was inspired by um, uh, actually my book, Zombie in Love. I was doing research on zombies, which don't you love my job? <laughs> I came across this this web page of the, this place that was selling all this zombie merchandise. And they actually had a page called zombies and bacon, which is a weird combination, but it was all these weird bacon things like bacon band-aids and bacon toothpaste and bacon candy and socks and all this really weird stuff. And so I just was like, you know, what's up with bacon? You know, everyone loves bacon. I'm like, wait a minute, everyone loves bacon has anyone ever written a picture book starring a piece of bacon? <laughs> so, um, and turns out nobody had. So, so yeah, you can find story ideas pretty much anywhere. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a great idea, but that one actually turned out to be a pretty funny story. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So I'm going to ask you a very important question here. I know all, a lot of kids want to know this. Do you have any pets at home? <laughs> You probably saw one just come in the door here. That was Pearl. <laughs> I learned a long time ago from doing these virtual uh, events that I have to keep my office doors open because if I shut them, then they have to be in here. And so then you will see them jumping up on the on the door and pawing to get in. Uh, so if I keep the door open, they kind of come and go and they don't generally disturb me unless a dog happens to walk by outside and then you will hear that. Um, but yes, I have three dogs now. So oh I have since pretty much replaced my children with dogs. <laughs> uh, as one um, does. So I have Pearl and I have Finley and then I have Lewis. So yeah. Um, but yeah, growing up, I had all kinds of see, she's she's now gonna bother me <laughs> for her for her treat because she knows that she can blackmail me into treats. Um Absolutely. But yeah, growing up on a farm in Rochester, like I did have a pet goat and we had uh, rabbits and chickens and I had a horse. And so um, a lot of the books that I've written are about animals because I'm a big softie when it comes to animals and I love animal stories. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so 
what about, so some of your newer stories, Mm -hmm. you know, um, so one of the latest stories that you wrote about is about a mermaid. Mm -hmm. So how did that come to be? Well, um, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, So not all stories, all all of my books that are published are my own ideas. Uh, Una is actually a character that was created by the illustrator, Riza Figueroa. And she had created this mermaid and it was um, on her Instagram page and for this um, thing called uh, May, it's, it's for where artists feature mermaids during the month of May. And so she had created this little mermaid And she got a lot of attention and an editor saw this character and just fell in love with the character, but there was no story. So um, I was asked if I could create a story for this character. And that's happened actually a few different times in my career with a few different books. Um, Let me think, Superman, He Stands Up is another book that I wrote that was started with the art first. Um, so basically then my job is to, you know, really look at the character and just kind of wait for them to speak to me. <laughs> I know that sounds right. a little bit crazy, but that's kind of how it works. Um, and so that's what I did. And the first version of this book is very different than the version that I will be reading to everyone in a little bit. Um, okay. In the first version, it was kind of um, a very different story where she had parents and it was kind of more like a fancy Nancy type of story, I guess I would compare it to. And um, and my editor read it and she's like, that's good. But she's like, I feel like it's missing something. And so... I started completely over, (laughs) which kids out there, sometimes that happens with writing and in your assignments. Like if it's not working, sometimes it's really hard to start over, but that's what I did. I started completely over and it became a whole new story. Um, And so I really love what happened in this version. And it's funny because you'll hear me say Una missing her spark in in this one. And so it's kind of, you know, I brought that into the story. Um, And so, yeah, so it was created actually by the illustrator. So that's another thing I probably should have pointed out earlier that I am the author of all the books and I do not illustrate. We can talk a little bit more about that maybe um, in a bit, but I, write all the stories and I can kind of sort of draw, but I can actually show you something from my childhood that I drew and uh, illustrated. So. Oh um, yeah. We would love to see that. (laughs) (laughs) Do you want me to show you now? Absolutely. (laughs) Okay. Let me go back to Una because I know kids probably want to hear a story. That's probably why they're here today. But um, a lot of the um, projects and artwork that I did when I was a kid ended up getting damaged in a, a, uh, when our basement flooded, some people out there might be able to relate oh. to that. Now, oh, well, the rain we've had this summer, right? Oh. Um, so, but this was actually saved and you can see how it has water damage on it. <laughs> oh no. But it was um, a comic series that I created. I was in sixth grade oh, and it's called goodness. Vegetable Hospital. And it was inspired by the soap opera General Hospital. <laughs> Oh, I love it still on television today, but I created all these different characters. There's, you know, all this drama going on and there's um, a banana who's um, in the hospital and then this the pickles have triplets and there's a plane crashing and there's just all this soap opery stuff going on in this comic strip series with vegetables, uh, with vegetables <laughs> and, fruits. and so it's kind of funny that you know later I went on to you know write books like everyone loves cupcake <laughs> because Absolutely. you can kind of see that but so yeah I I could draw when you see these pictures I had a pretty good handle on art but uh, when I got to middle school and I started taking art classes, I got really intimidated by uh, my, my peers. And I started to look at, you know, what they were drawing and I was comparing myself and, and I convinced myself that I couldn't draw because I like to do humorous art. That was where I, where I loved and where I shined. Um, but, you know, so when it came time to draw like a bowl of fruit, you know, I wanted to give them eyeballs and smiles <laughs> and make them talk. <laughs> And that really wasn't the assignment. So I had kind of talked myself out of the idea of of becoming an artist. And so, but yeah, I always share that story with kids too, because I know kids out there, you guys love things, you know, maybe it's art isn't your thing, but maybe it's music or it's dance or it's sports. And it's really important not to compare yourself to other kids and just stick with what you love 
because if I had done that, then maybe I would have grown up to be an author and an illustrator, right? So <laughs> that's my little spiel for, for art and sticking to what you love. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so speaking of discovering what you are really good at, um, so why don't you share um, Una with us so okay. that we can discover what Una is good at? Okay, well, I would love to do that. So, of course, here's the beautiful cover. And as I mentioned, the um, illustrator is Riza Figueroa. And uh, she actually lives in California. Um, a lot of people are always surprised when they find out, you know, that um, the illustrators aren't in, in Michigan. We don't go to the coffee shop together and brainstorm these books. A lot of times I don't even meet the artists. Um, I've met a handful of them, of course, with over the years. But um, yeah, so it's a very different process. Um, I write the story generally first. And then the illustrator will get a copy of the, the manuscript and do the art. And so, um, but she, of course, this one, as I told you, started with this little character sketch of the mermaid. So this is the story, Una. Una was sweet and a little bit salty like the ocean where she lived. She was also brave and curious, like most treasure hunters. When Una was just a baby, no bigger than a scallop, she chased a pearl into the mouth of a whale. Lucky for her, she popped right back out. As the years passed, Una found bigger treasure and even bigger trouble. It's a good thing she has Otto. Otto is an otter. Una rescued Otto from an oyster net when he was just a pup. She taught him tricks like sit, roll over, walrus, and her favorite, pufferfish. Can you make a pufferfish? Una and Otto searched for treasure nearly every day. They uncovered keys and coins and buttons and bottles. And sometimes they even found lost gold and sometimes lost glasses. <laughs> but there was one special treasure Una could never quite reach the crown. It was extra sparkly in a, way that, in a way that made Una's heart thump, but the crown was stuck deep in the rift and not a pole or a pail or the sticky stick of a snail could get it unstuck. Still, Una was determined. <laughs> Her next plan was a good one. She'd knock the crown loose. Unfortunately, the current shifted, the lobster crate and rock drifted, and the squid, well, see for yourself. What do squids do? They spray their ink, right? Like an octopus? It's hard to say who was more surprised when the water cleared, Una or the shark. Her third plan most definitely would have worked if the crabs hadn't been so crabby and the waves hadn't been so wavy and if that long ship plank hadn't bumped her on the head hard before the greedy, greedy rift gobbled it up too. Poor Una, this was getting personal. She shouted into the pit, you can keep your dumb crown, I quit. Generally speaking, mermaids are not quitters, but at this point, one could hardly blame her. See her looking so defeated there? <sighs> Instead of looking for treasure with Otto, Una napped on the rocks with the sea lions. She drew pictures in the sand with the starfish, and she read from her favorite glass bottles with her land friends. All of this would have been perfectly fine, except 
Una wasn't perfectly fine. Clearly she was missing her spark. And a mermaid without her spark is like a seagull without an appetite. Unnatural, right? Seagulls like to eat. A seashell washed ashore. Una studied it thoughtfully. It gave her an idea. She got right to work. The next day, Una peered nervously into the rift. Why did it look so much deeper and scarier than she remembered? Otto pretended to be a narwhal making Una laugh. Admittedly, her new treasure hunting goggles she had invented were funny looking, but they were also her best shot at reaching the crown. See those goggles she invented? She dove to the bottom of the murky rift. That's when Una noticed something she couldn't see from above, a bridge. Huh, a bridge made from a crate, a rock, and the very same plank that plunked her on the head. And it led straight to the crown. But what was that rumbling sound? It grew louder and louder. <sighs> the ocean floor shook and the water around Una churned into a thick stew of swirling sand and sea creatures. She couldn't see, she felt trapped. Would the hungry rift gobble her up too? <gasps> Through the commotion, Una heard something else in the distance. It was faint, but comforting and familiar, the whales. Una sang along until the rumbling stopped and the water cleared. Finally, this was her chance. Una held her breath, <gasps> ready, steady, aim. <gasps> Clink! Hooray! Look at that. She got it. We did it, Una cheered, placing the crown on her best friend. It really is beautiful, she gushed. But these, Una said excitedly, holding up her new goggles, these are spectacular. Otto agreed because sometimes the best treasure in the world isn't found. It's made. The end. <laughs> oh, I love that story. Thank you. Thank love you. Love it. Now, yeah. I know we have lots of questions coming in, but before we get to the questions, I just have to ask, what is the future for Una? Is it, is it a start of a series? Well, it's funny. You should ask. Just last week, I turned in the third Una book. <laughs> so, oh, my goodness. Yes. Yeah, so the, the second uh, Una book is coming out in January. And the second one is called Una and the Shark. And that's where we get to learn a little bit more about the character here, the Hammerhead Shark. Okay. And it turns out his name is Stanley. <laughs> and... Uh, so we learn a little bit about um, that uh, shark in this second book. And in the third one, I will tell you the title, which is pretty still top secret. Um, and it's called Una in the Arctic. And so we're gonna have a whole new setting for, for Una and Otto. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to see what Riza does with the illustrations in that book. It's gonna be beautiful, I just know it. <laughs> oh, I love it, very cool. All right. Well, I think we, we want to get to some of these questions that are popping up here. Speaking of popping up, I, I popped up so I can ask um, the questions that have been coming in. <laughs> so our first question is from Marion, and she wants to know, Kelly, what is the favorite book of yours that you've written? Oh, my so goodness. Your, your favorite of your own books. Right. You know, I get asked this question a lot. Um, Almost every school visit I go to, kids ask me the same thing. They want to know if I have a favorite book. And I really and truly don't. Um, they're all my babies. <laughs> and I, I love them all for different reasons. 
Um, you know, some of them, I may just really love the art. Some I might love um, what the story has meant to other kids. Like I wrote a book number of years ago, can't believe it's been 14 years, but a book called Grace for President, right? And this story has inspired a lot of kids, particularly little girls thinking about maybe growing up to be president one day. And so that makes this book really special. Um, yeah, so they're all special to me in their own way, but I really and truly don't have one favorite book, but that's okay if you guys out there have a favorite Kelly DiPuccio book. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Well, Timmy wants to know if you have, like, who do you like to read or what books do you read? Oh my gosh. Well, you know, I pretty much only read um, children's like middle grade novels, young adult novels. Once in a while, I will read a, a grown up book, but I really think of um, middle grade in YA as really everybody books, just like I think of picture books as everybody books. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. And again, asking an author to pick a favorite book or author is like impossible. <laughs> but um, yeah, I pretty much absorb um, all of the children's genres and just kind of live in that world. Because really, I find a lot of inspiration from even if it's a middle grade novel, I just get inspired by really great writers. And, and so, I, um, so yeah, I'm just I pretty much exclusively read in those genres. So here, this is an interesting question. Um, you know, how do you handle it as the author if you feel that the illustrations don't work with what you've written? Yeah, um, you know, when I first started doing this many, many years ago, it was kind of hard for me to let go of that process. <laughs> you know, like um, I had written the story. And of course, when you write any story, every story, you have pictures in your head because that's just, you know, how your, your mind works. And then you get the sketches from the artist and it's completely different. <laughs> so um, I learned a long time ago to just let go of that. And um, I find that the illustrators bring so much more to the story than I could even imagine because even though I do like to dabble in art, I am a word person. I am very much a word person. And so um, it's always really exciting to see how somebody takes the words and, and, and runs with them. But if there is something that I have a, you know, an issue with, or I don't think is quite right, I can certainly like address that with my editor and they will kind of be the middle person to sort that out. But um, yeah, that doesn't happen very often. It would kind of have to be a situation where I really felt strongly about it because I trust that, you know, this is what they're doing. And it really, a picture book is a shared um, uh, art. It's, you know, words and pictures. And so, um, yeah, so it doesn't happen very often. But like I said, if it does happen, I can certainly address the, the issue. And it's up to the artist whether or not, you know, they agree, you know. <laughs> so here's another one. Um... Did, did your experience growing up in the Detroit area in, impact or influence your books, which, you know, we're the Metro Detroit Book and Author Society. We're all in Michigan. Um, you're in Michigan. Do you bring any Michigan elements into the books? Oh, let me think about that. Um, I, you know, I, I, in general, I would say that, you know, unless you consider the fact that, you know, in Michigan, we, you know, have a lot, I, a lot of the, I, animal stories that I do, but I don't do any nonfiction. Um, so that's not really an element that I explore. Although I have done some nonfiction manuscripts. I don't, it's something I don't generally do. The closest I got to that was, was the book that Jen mentioned with the sandwich swap, which was a book that I co-authored with uh, Queen Rania of Jordan. And um, it's a fiction book, but it's based on a true story from, from her childhood. And um, so that's probably as close as I got to that. But as far as Michigan, no. Um, although, um, like I said, I've born and bred in Michigan. I go all over the country and I talk to kids about, you know, Michigan and I always show them our, our map and kids are always really impressed when they don't live in Michigan that we have our own little map and I don't forget the UP. <laughs> So here's a question from Arwa. He, he wants to know, is it easy to think up a book? Is it easy to think of a book? You know, it, honestly, it, it is easy because I always say, do you love something? Um, do you love space? Do you love um, dirt bikes? Do you love horses? Do you love cars? Whatever it is that you love, 
you can find a story idea there. And I always tell kids, start there, start with the things that are interesting to you. And for some kids that is nonfiction, like my son um, always loved nonfiction books, particularly books about history. And so now he's getting his PhD in history. <laughs> and so um, that was definitely what, what he loved. And so, yeah, that's what I always tell kids, look for your ideas and the things that you, you love. And that's why I've written a lot of books about, you know, things that like, you know, like mermaids, which wasn't my idea, but I wrote a story about a Yeti because I just love mythical creatures and I love that kind of fantasy element. That's always fun for me. I have a book coming out um, in October about mice because believe it or not, I love it. I mostly like the, 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 ma the imaginary mice, <laughs> not necessarily mice that would be in my house, but um, this is a story about little mice. So yeah, so that's what I would tell you is um, it's easy to find ideas if you have uh, things that you're interested in that you love. Well, here's another question. And actually, um, Arwa is not Arwa, it's um, she, and, and oh. she's Aisha. Um, oh. So I want to make sure I, I say that. And then um, she you. wants to know if it's easy to make characters. So I know you talked about stories, but how about characters like Una? Well, yeah, and a lot of stories do begin with um, a character and then the, the storyline or the plot kind of grows from that character. Um, I have uh, that book, of course, Grace for President, right? So here's a little girl who's the main character and she asks a question. And so her question is, you know, where are the girls when she sees a poster of all the American presidents, right? So we have a character who asks a question and that one question inspires this whole story. So um, characters can definitely lead you on journeys. Um, I wrote a book called Gaston about a French bulldog. And this story was really inspired by the character. The character became, became uh, the first part of it because I love French bulldogs. I don't have one of my own because my husband has allergies, but um, so I was imagining a story about a French bulldog and I thought, what if I had a story about a French bulldog who grows up with a family of French poodles? You know, again, sometimes I ask myself the questions and that will inspire the story to kind of be built around the character. So um, yeah, so again, you know, creating characters is just, what, what would be interesting to you? What do you find fascinating or what do you find funny? And, um, and then just kind of, you know, listen to your character, let them tell you what their story is or what their problem is, right? A lot of stories have problems and then you go from there. And then um, another, uh, another question from, from Mary and she wants to know if you would ever write chapter books for older readers. I've actually started <laughs> a few different chapter books um, and that really is my goal. Um, I may do like a young chapter book, but I've started a few different ones and um, I just haven't found the one with the spark, right? The spark we talked about. And so I haven't finished them and I think I kind of get lost in the middle. And um, so that's really something that I still need to overcome, you know, my fear of failure. That, that, I think that happens to everyone. And, uh, and, it, and the reality is some people just don't write across all different genres. And so often if I'm working on a chapter book, I find then somehow somewhere along the way, I'll find a new picture book idea. And I'm like, oh, this is a great idea. And then I go and work on that because that's where I'm comfortable and that's where, where I, I, I shine. And so I kind of go back to that. So we'll see, maybe one day I will finish one. If I do, great. If I don't, that's fine too. <laughs> Oh, um, the question just came in. What's your dog's name? Because your dog, <laughs> that one that keeps pop popping in, that is Pearl. That is Pearl. And uh, she's my one female dog. And um, yeah, she, she knows how to work me. Let me tell you, if I'm ever on the phone talking to somebody, she comes around, she does this little begging thing, which she thinks is really cute. And um and tries to get treats out of me just so they sh so that she'll go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, the follow up is is her pet bed an oyster? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a serious question. Um, there's been some talk that authors and perhaps publishers um, don't like libraries because um, libraries negative 
the, the, the argument is that libraries negatively impact book sales because people check out books from the library instead of buying them. As an author, what do you think about that? Oh, wow. You know, libraries were my saving grace growing up because we didn't have a lot of money and we would always go to the library and I would check out stacks and stacks of books. I, as I mentioned, I was a big, big reader when I was a kid. And so I would go through these weird phases where like I would only read Westerns <laughs> or that I would only read mysteries, you know, but I was that kid who when I found something that I loved, I couldn't get enough of it. And that's the beauty of a library is that you have that freedom to do that. You could go through a whole, you know, category of books and, um, and check them out. And I'm, when I ever go to schools, because sometimes schools will do book sales and, you know, there are some kids who say, I don't have a book. And I'm like, well, go to your library. They have my books and you can check them out. And their eyes just light up and they get really excited. Um, and so, and, and kids often come to me like, and tell me too, that they found my books at the library and they're really excited to share that with me. So, um, they are an invaluable resource for not only children, but for, for, for humanity <laughs> really and truly. So, yes. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm sure, sure Jen does too. And, um, no, and, and libraries, we want to make authors works available. So just like you said, you know, so if you can't, you know, who can afford every book and, and you want to explore all of your interests and have that opportunity to just dive in and spend as much time as you want. So thank you, Kelly, for being <laughs> our cheerleader. <laughs> You're welcome. So I, I'm just looking at the questions. Um, to make sure that we have everything, because I think we have time for maybe a couple more. Um, here's another one. Is it easy to get through something that takes a long time without getting bored or just quitting altogether? Hmm, that's a great question. Yeah, because sometimes that will happen uh, when I'm writing a, a, a story uh, that I might kind of get stuck. And that happens, you know, all writers get writer's block at some point. And for me, I have found really one of the best things to do is just put it aside and give it a break. And um, maybe I go out for a walk or um, sometimes that break can last weeks, sometimes even months um, before I will revisit it. Sometimes even years <laughs> where I've had stories that I've kind of had to put aside. And then, you know, I get busy with life and I'm working on other things. And every once in a while, I'll go through my computer files and I will revisit some stories. And sometimes I go like, oh, wow, I love this story. And like, after I've had that distance, I know like, no, oh, I know how to fix this. I know how to get through this. And other times I'll open a file and go, wow, that was a really a stinky story. <laughs> you know, We're going to close that one right back up. But I, I never throw my stories away. I always save them. Um, so yeah, but getting stuck and, 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 and even bored, you know, and I always tell kids this too, you know, like if you're getting really bored writing it, you have to consider, well, maybe would other people be bored reading it, you know? So that's just, you know, I always try to tune into my feelings you know, am I, and not that I have to have fun writing every single story because it's all, not all stories about are about having fun, but am I feeling something? Am I feeling happy? Am I feeling sad? Am I feeling angry? Um, because if I'm feeling those emotions, then hopefully my reader will feel them too. Cause that's what we want from our readers. We want them to feel something, right? So let's see, I just want to make sure I've covered everything. There's um, two, two more. Um, and the first is, um, how do you come up with your titles? Ah, titles. Yeah, titles are a, a, a funny thing because some stories will come to me first with a title. Like I'll have a great title for a book, you know, like everyone loves bacon, right? <laughs> and so, um, and then I kind of like, we'll build a story around the title. I wrote a, a book many years ago called Dino Snores because it had a great title. And so I wrote a story about that. Um, other times the character will come first. And like, as I mentioned with Gaston, it was a French bulldog. And so when I was trying to name this character, well, the first French name that came into my head was Gaston because my oldest daughter was obsessed with Beauty and the Beast when she was a little girl. <laughs> and so that was the first name that popped into my head was Gaston. And so I named the French bulldog Gaston. Um, so, uh, but yeah, titles are important, you know, really, you know, and when you go to your library, a lot of books are shelved this way. So this is a spine, right? And so that's what you see. And so you want to grab 
grab your reader's attention and try to come up with a title that might pique their interest. Um, 40 Winks is a book, as I mentioned, that's coming out. And that's an old expression about sleep, right? And so I decided to create a family of mice that um, have 38 children. <laughs> and so I kind of played off the, the words, right? The puns and stuff, which I you know, often do. And so um, here's a, just a little sneak peek of this family. <laughs> People often comment on Gaston, the names in there, fee fee foo foo la Gaston. Well, in this one, I name all 38 children. <laughs> And so it is so much fun to read. I cannot tell you how much fun. Jen, you will love reading this oh, one. Oh Wilma Winky, Walter Stinky, Itty Bitty Boo, Gabby Gubby Tiny, Chubby Stella, Little Stew, Larry Lucky, Lulu Bucky, Meanie Miney Mo, Tucker Tipper, Scooter Skipper, Fleckles Farley Flow. That's as far as I've gotten. I have to memorize more. Wow. <laughs> but I have a little bit of time to work on that. <laughs> That's awesome. The last question that um, was asked is how do your characters become stuffed animals, stuffies? I think you have somebody yes. behind you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by magic. It's just magic. <laughs> you know, before I, I published my first book, I would sometimes see the plushies, you know, of like Lily in the plastic purse and Clifford and all these little things. And it was like this dream, like, oh my gosh, can you imagine someday having a plushie of your character? And again, I didn't dare to dream that big. I just never imagined that that would be something that would happen in my career. And so, and it, and it did. And I had really very little to do with it other than it was magical. And Christian Robinson is the, I should have mentioned, the wonderful, amazing uh, illustrator of Gaston and Antoinette among uh, many, many other books. And so um, it, he just, this dog kind of became this kind of iconic character in, in terms of sitting in the chair and stuff. So there was just a company that that's what they do. They make, um, you know, literary plushies. And so they just fell in love with Gaston and turned him into oh. a little stuffy. Oh, <laughs> and so in this great. case, big stuffy. There's a little one and then there's a big one. <laughs> Aww, that is so great. Well, those are all the questions. So I'm going to um, step away for just a minute and let the two of you wrap up and then I'll come back and close this out. Thank you. All right. So I have to ask, do you have a favorite place that you like to write? You know, some people feel inspired in different areas. Do you write at home? Do you have a special spot outside that you like to write? What inspires you? Where do you feel the most inspired? You know, when I'm originally coming up with ideas, a lot of times I do love to sit outside and I find the inspiration from nature and just the peacefulness of being out, outdoors. Um, a lot of my serious writing happens right here in my office because I have my computer. But uh, those are early drafts where I use notebook and, and pen or paper. Like I just scribble my notes and I listen to the story in my head and I really try to get out of my own way. That's really the best way for me to do that. And so um, I stay away from the computer when I'm at that stage. Um, so that can happen anywhere. I've written stories on airplanes before. <laughs> I've yeah. written stories in, you know, coffee shops. You know, um, I'll sometimes have to pull over on the side. And if I hear a story in my head, like sometimes they'll come to me and rhyme and you don't want to forget that. So I will jot it down on even like a, a, a gum wrapper from my purse or something. <laughs> you know, <laughs> So really those early drafts can start anywhere. But I really don't have a favorite you know, place. It's just wherever the ideas are coming to me, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> of course. So what would be the most important tip that you can give to kids who would like to be an author someday? Well, the most important advice I could give you is to read, <laughs> read, read, read. And I know that sounds very basic, but honestly, I learned from every book that I read and they inspire me in all different ways. And so, um, you know, you can keep a little journal and, you know, write down the things that you loved about a book or, or what you didn't like about a book. Sometimes that's just as helpful. 
And because, you know, when you read a lot of books, you tend to forget over time, like, you know, all the details and stuff. So if you can kind of keep a record of it, then when you're writing your own stories, you can go back and say, oh, I really love this about this story. And I wonder if there's a way to incorporate that element into my my own story. So that's really helpful. Um, so, yeah. And I and like I hear sometimes from kids, well, I don't like to read. And so I just say to them, you haven't found you know, the right thing. And that's where libraries are so fantastic because you can choose from so many different things, right? You can go and look at a graphic novel. Maybe that's where you, you, you really love uh, to read is graphic novels or the nonfiction, like I mentioned. So um, it's just finding what you love and finding the genre that's appropriate for you and, and, and finding the inspiration in those books. Absolutely. Definitely. Okay, so before we wrap up today, um, can you, do you want to share anything that you have coming up um, before we go? Well, um, I didn't quite really mention the new book that just came out. This is my yeah. newest title called Not Yeti and Claire Keen is the illustrator. And I really love this story because it's really about how we make the world a better place by our small acts of kindness, little things that we can do. The first line in the book, which I wrote a few years ago, but was really kind of relevant in recent years is um, the world is full of monsters. <laughs> and, um, and so it's, it's about a Yeti who's very kind and very gentle and, um, and how he makes a difference in the world just by being himself. And, uh, which is a pretty nice guy. Um, so I wanted to mention that one. And also to going back to the book beat who uh, they will be selling books. Um, and I'm going to be popping in sometime Thursday morning to um, autograph books. So if you are a person who wanted a book sign, maybe you have a birthday party coming up and you want to give a gift to someone or a baby shower and you want it personalized or for, for, for yourself, um, and you can leave a note with the book beat and I'm sure they're going to keep some kind of list. And so when I go in, I'm going to sign those and personalize them. And so I just wanted to, to share that as well. Yay. Well, thank you so much for being here with, with us today, Kelly. Well, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Kelly, I want to thank you too. Um, I can't wait to read Not Yeti, but I really also want to read 40 Wings because I want to learn all the, all the names and sing the song. <laughs> it is it is so much fun. And, you know, the last page, you know, after, because I know kids, kids are really quick and they learn so fast. And so one of the last, the last pages, is, it doesn't list their names, but it says, how many winks can you name? So they're not <laughs> named, but they are in order. So kids could go along and, 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 and name them eventually. But um, yeah, so Lita Judge, I have shout out to Lita, who's the illustrator. My goodness, what a task she had in creating all these different mice and giving them unique um, personalities and characteristics. And so, yeah, what an undertaking that must have been for her. <laughs> well, I hope you'll come back and see us because maybe we can sing the song together. Maybe I will have learned yeah. about it. <laughs> That would be a lot of fun. There we go. <laughs> it would be wonderful to have you back. And I really appreciate you um, being with us today and being such a wonderful guest. And just um, it really enhances, I think, the whole summer summer reading experience for libraries to be able to talk to to such a, um, a wonderful author. But I'm trying to think of my words. So kids, I lose words sometimes. Too, <laughs> but, um, but just... Um, somebody who writes the books that we love. It's just, it's, I always am so um, awestruck that when I get to talk to someone who writes a book that I love. So thank uh, you. I mean, well, I, I truly am the lucky one in this that, um, that I'm doing what I love and I get to share these stories with kids everywhere and, and grownups as well. And so um, I'm really fortunate and really happy to be here this evening to to share these stories with you and to meet everyone and so thank you oh yeah no we will have you back and I also <laughs> want to thank Jen Taggart um for for being our special secret weapon and yeah. um, taking the time to um to help us out with this interview and we hope you will come back and see us again too my pleasure <laughs>
excellent. Thank you, Jen. So, <laughs> so for you. everybody watching or listening um, or watching on um, Facebook Live, um, we want to thank you for coming too. It was great to have so many people signed up, especially so many kids. And we, we really appreciate and love all the questions. So thank you for helping to, to make the program even better with all of your great questions. And I hope, um, I think I can speak for all of us here, that um, we hope that you'll keep reading and visit your library because I can say for all the people who work in libraries, we're always so glad to see you. So come by and see us. And don't forget, if you want to purchase any of Kelly's books, they're available at BookBeat in Oak Park, or you can purchase online at thebookbeat.com. And we did put information about that in the chat. And if you purchase between now and Thursday, Kelly will personalize that for you. So what that means, um, so Aisha, you were asking some great questions. If you want Kelly to write your name in a book, she'll do that for you. So anyway, so with that, I will say thank you all once more for coming. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. And everybody just keep reading. So. <laughs> That's right. Have a great night. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.